Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Before early European farmers had reached the Berkshires and begun to cut the forests and turn the soil for the first time, a tiny seed began to sprout, became a sapling, and that sapling, a young tree. This tree was first mentioned in a story that goes like this. Isabel Walton was a young girl, almost a woman, when during the French and Indian War, her fledgling village was raided. Her father, the only family she had left, was killed. The natives that had attacked them who'd been working with the French and had come all the way from Canada, gathered up those who had survived and began to march them back northward, where they would be held for ransom. Those prisoners who weren't fit enough to walk all the way to Canada were often killed. This being said, it's distressing to discover that poor Isabel was weakening. The natives of this story are said to have taken delight in the idea of, instead of dispatching her quickly, letting her suffer. They tied her to the young tree, an elm, and piled sticks all around her feet, with the intention of setting her alight. But just as they were about to set the fire, a small group of their French comrades arrived to see how they'd made out during their raid. The lieutenant in charge, angered by the sight of the stoic girl tied to the elm, awaiting her fate, ordered her freed, but the natives would not. So he was forced to compromise, and paid from his own pocket for her release. This is how not only Isabel, but also the young elm tree, were saved from the flames. I can't say this story rings terribly true. I could be wrong, but I just couldn't find any record of an Isabel Walton being taken captive during any span of the French and Indian War. So, though this story may seem to be the earliest tale about the great Pittsfield elm, it may have been made up much later to add a little more interest to the massive tree. And of course, what proof do we have that this young sapling was indeed the same elm that would grow up to be the massive, famous Pittsfield elm? But of course, one of the fine wares we deal here at the Berkshires Gone By is legend, and so it's included. Godfrey Greylock states in his book, Taconic, The Romance and Beauty of the Hills, that she married her savior a short time later after reaching Canada, and that his name was Pierre Lanadier, and that the descendants of the couple still possess a portrait of Isabel. He claims that this painting shows her with large blue eyes, bright blonde hair, and round rosy cheeks. The land that was known as Pontusac was purchased in 1738 by Colonel Jacob Wendell. He and two of his friends planned out parcels and sold those off to a group of settlers living in the town of Westfield, Massachusetts, in Hamden County. These settlers began to clear their plots of trees, but were forced to flee during the French and Indian War. After things settled down again, many of them returned and were finally able to begin farming. They were also able to construct real homes. In 1753, the town was incorporated with the name Pontusac Plantation. It became apparent that a village center was threatening to spontaneously form. But before that could happen, before the city streets were given the chance to evolve from cow paths, it was decided that Captain Charles Goodrich should be given the job of mapping out the future roads of the village. So he gathered his surveying tools and marched into the woods. Trees were coming down quickly in the area. To make a living as a farmer, one needs fields. 
and they were set on creating them as quickly as possible. But the spot decided to be the town center was yet untouched. It was there that Charles found a great elm, and used this towering mass as a focal point for his map. This tree was strangely tall, even when compared to other elms in the area, and from this tree were drawn the compass roads of north, east, south, and west streets. And as he ventured further away to lay the way for other streets, he could see its great height from afar and use it to situate himself. As he mapped and the roads were finalized, men with axes moved in to clear the way. One of those men raised an axe against the great elm and struck it twice before Charles was able to reach him and tell him to stop. He still needed the tree, and had frankly grown rather fond of it. He told all the axemen that cutting the great elm was not an option. He even decided to divert the intersection around the tree to spare it. This diversion evolved into a park or green. Parks and greens were important places in a colonial town. These were places where business could be done, where people would sometimes meet for the buying and selling of goods, and where meetings could be held if the crowd were too big to fit in the local meeting house, or if the weather were too hot to sit inside a stifling building, meetings would sometimes be held under the shade of the trees in the green. A meeting house was constructed overlooking the park, and the name of the town was changed to Pittsfield, in honor of William Pitt, a French and Indian War and Revolutionary War hero. With the progress of time, the Great Elm was witness to the expansion of industry, from farming to mills. And the Great Elm wasn't, of course, the only tree, or elm, on the lot. But it was by far the biggest. Its trunk towered into the air like a great column, and from it split two larger branches of almost equal size. From those sprang thinner limbs, which sprouted the long oval leaves iconic of an elm, and the tree was scarred, as sometime in the past it had been struck by lightning. Over the years, other trees would be removed from the park, but not the elm. It had taken hold of many of the locals, who thought it to be the pride of the town, and would stop to ponder its great height and majesty while going about their daily routines. It was in fact so big that it was beginning to become a tourist attraction. As the town grew, it was decided that a larger meeting house was needed. This put the great elm in harm's way. Because of its location at the center of the town, many of the people thought that the center of town was where the meeting house should be. The corners around the park were already taken up, but not the park itself. So the idea was that the elm should come down, and that that park should instead be the home of the new meeting house. But this idea was considered so outrageous by so many locals, and created such an outcry that the plan was abandoned, and room was instead made a short distance away for the building, though the construction materials did spend a long period of time piled around the tree. Even then, the elm still wasn't safe, for the park that the elm stood in was a park and title only, and not officially protected from development. When again the tree was targeted to make way for another building, a townswoman, named Lucretia Williams, is said to have physically thrown herself in front of an axeman, hired to remove the elm, and refused to budge, until the men promised to leave the tree alone. A short while later, she argued with the planners of the project and convinced them to take a section of her nearby estate in exchange for the official preservation of the park and its mighty elm. The men relented. This meant that it would also become the location of monuments and a fountain, and was beautified. This created another problem, though. As people looking to come and sit in the park, 
or attend a meeting in the meeting house nearby, or would often be in need of a place to tie up a horse. With the booming population, there simply weren't enough hitching posts in town. So, people began to tie their horses to trees in the park. This also included, of course, the elm. But the elm had no lower branches, none reachable by a mere human, anyway, and soon fell victim to carriage and coach drivers, who would instead drive metal spikes into the trunk to tie their horses to. Bored horses would chew the bark to pass the time, and frustrated animals would sometimes yank the spikes out, leaving large open wounds in the elm, a prime location for insect infestation. This time, Edward Newton came to the rescue. A relative by marriage to Lucretia Williams, he had large stones set encircling the elm, preventing carriages from being able to get close enough to tie up horses. The nation's first agricultural fair took place in the shadow of the Great Elm, coordinated by Elkanah Watson in 1807. During the second, in 1810, this same fair would promote many varieties of livestock, either newly bred in the States or recently imported from the Old World. But in 1807, Mr. Watson only had a small flock of sheep, but not any ordinary sheep. For five years before, Moreno sheep had been introduced to Vermont's farming economy from Europe. Being so close to Vermont, it wasn't long before their fine fleece was recognized in Pittsfield. These sheep were a huge success at the fair, drawing a great deal of attention and spawning the creation of a thriving woolen mill industry in the city. Again, the population jumped as people moved to the area attracted by the plentiful jobs. Meanwhile, the layout of the park had evolved a bit over time and had become a well-defined 1.5-acre oval. In 1819, the tree was again struck by lightning its height being its enemy as much as any human, and had lost a large limb from its crown. In 1825, General Lafayette spoke to the people of Pittsfield while standing beneath the great elm. In 1826, a potter named James Clues used an image of the park to adorn pottery. The tree was featured along with other notable sites from around the country in a series of pieces he entitled American Scenes. Twice again, the tree was struck by lightning, deep craggy splits left in its flesh. It's then that the great elm began to wane. With the coming summers, the tree produced fewer and fewer leaves. The bark cracked, and the bare branches high above turned gray and sun-bleached, sometimes snapping off and falling with a loud thud from their spots in the sky. In 1864, on a warm July day, the tree was at last cut down. It was dead for certain, bending and gray. It began to pose a risk to anyone standing around it and any building nearby. If it were to fall of its own accord, it could certainly have done quite a bit of damage. But it wasn't felled without mourners. Many gathered to see the giant's demise, and the sorrowful city insisted that it not be for nothing. Chairs were made from its wood, one for the first church and one for the town hall, and a podium, as well as baubles and mementos, were made for the public. Before it was carted away, it was measured, but this time it wasn't just an estimate. The tree came in at 128 feet tall, a staggering 90 feet from the ground to the lowest branch, 9 feet 4 inches in diameter, and 28 feet in circumference. It was a record-breaking tree. That was for certain. When its rings were finally counted up, its age was determined to be 340 years. The tree had been a sprout, well before European settlers had arrived in the area, and lasted well into the Industrial Age, expiring just before the advent of cars. It was the delight 
of generations of Pittsfield's residents and described as the pride of the town. It inspired artists and writers such as Herman Melville. Elms in general suffered decades after when Dutch elm disease swept the nation, killing most of the great giants. There are still elms in Pittsfield, but none yet as large and impressive as the great elm of Park Square. Most elms still contract Dutch elm disease and are killed before they're able to reach any great height. The great elm still holds a place in the hearts of the city. That an entire city was able to grow up around something so entirely native and natural. Something that linked the rapidly changing world to the distant past was outstanding. The love for this tree that grew in the hearts of the people still is. The tree is gone, but what it taught us is not. That our connection to the past is important. That it can be as deep and valuable as ever and its memory is still there to remind us just how much has changed. Like a ghost. Like a gem. Like an eternal colossal column reaching into the sky. This has been The Berkshires Gone By. Created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Granier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook you can find more full episodes on Facebook, YouTube, or at our website, www.theberkshiresgoneby.com. There you will also find images pertaining to all of our topics and past episodes. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>